Now we're in uh, for a treat. Christina is going to take the wheel, uh, and it's not an iPad. It's a real car with choice. The floor is yours, Christina. Thank you. So we're going to switch gears here and sort of shift the energy a little bit and talk about bootstrapping the future from my father's point of view. So when you think of Doug Engelbart, what do you think of? Making a difference, making the world a better place. That was his goal from the start. How can I make the world a better place? And he realized instantly that um, it's a collective effort, that all the people and all the organizations that are working on some aspect of fixing the world and making it a better place, it is a collective effort. It takes organizations. It takes teams, initiatives, organizations, and collectives of organizations working together, pulling together toward the same goal. So he thought about how could tools help with that. So this is not animated the way I had it on my own. <laughs> Sorry put this all together. Um, so most of us think, I mean, the most canonical thing is to, is to think of him as the man who invented the mouse. He did the demo. He networked personal computers and uh, various technologies. So that's on the sort of technology arena. And then a lot of people think about him and put him as the history of technology because he did all that back then. Um, and I think Alan Kay uh, quoted Brett Victor earlier this morning, and I have the second half of that quote. <laughs> the least important question you can ask about Engelbart is what did he build? The most important question you can ask about Engelbart is what was he trying to create? So he was trying to create a beautiful world where everybody could be safe and happy and all of that kind of thing everything could work together. So, um, so he was thinking ahead of the questions that we just heard on the panel before. Um, all of that, the technology then in service of a capability that he called augmenting the human intellect. And a lot of people sort of broadly just um, distill that to collaboration. So he obviously had all that teamwork and building that capability. It wasn't just the technologies. It was the technologies were co-evolving with all the methodologies and the paradigms and the attitudes and all of that within the team that was building it itself. So that co-evolution is what gives you the symbiotic relationship. And I think that's one of the big things that's missing today in a lot of technology is just sort of unleashed into the world. How do you get that symbiotic relationship? It's from the co-evolution so that we need to sort of speed up. How do you manage and accelerate the co-evolution? And that's what the bootstrapping did. It bootstrapping the co-evolution and speeding that up. Um, so he wasn't just prototyping the team. He was prototyping the team as a prototype of the organization of the future. So people think of the minimum viable prototype that he was building were the tools. And actually, it was the capability of the teams. But he was doing that so he could model, this is a prototype of the organization of the future. They need to be fast and flexible. They need to be able to change on a dime and pivot anywhere. And they need to be able to network out an accordion and reconfigure uh, any way that's required for, for the given purpose. Um, what, you're, what they're working on is very complex and urgent problems, the kinds of global issues and all of that kind of thing. What kind of organization is up to the task of that? And how do you evolve that organization? And so that's what he was prototyping. But he didn't stop with that because it's not just one organization. How do you do networks of organizations and all of that? So when he, uh, in the 19, early 1970s, when he brought in customer organizations onto the um, onto NLS through the ARPANET. That was the beginning of how do you network the change agents and network the co-evolution of all of this out into other organizations. So he really thought through this. And the framework that, um, that Gardner Campbell presented to us this morning, starting in 1959, he was asking himself these questions. What kind of organization is it going to be? And how different is the world going to be? And he worked out this whole methodology and the whole sort of bootstrapping formula before he ever had a lab, before he ever built any tools. So he already understood the need for this because he studied in a very comprehensive way. And it always reminds me of um, 
sort of the story of Newton trying to sit down and work out the, the movement of the planets or whatever, and it, the math didn't go there with him. The math wasn't sufficient. So he said, oh, okay, well, then we need more math. And so he, he worked out the math so that then he would have the math to do that. And that's what my dad did is that he, he said, oh, gee, he had an insight about organizations or an insight about coevolution. Well, who's working on this? Nobody's working on this. Oh, well, then I guess I better sit down and think about it myself. So the whole thing is very comprehensive. Um, so um, scaling up, and then so, so networks of networks and networks of, of networks of networks, and that scaling up to um, how do you get it to the grand challenge level? Because if something this important about how do we get the capabilities into the organization sooner than otherwise, than if we just let them meander, um, that could take a grand challenge. That's where the government comes in. How come we don't, you know, government, industry, NGO, nonprofit, nonprofit uh, collaboration. So um, the bootstrap strategy that he designed in the early 1960s was designed for this whole model. And it was designed so that you could get the coevolution going and that you would have the, um, the tools and the, you know, how, what are all the things that you need to change in the organization so it can behave in the way it needs to, to be able to respond to the, to the challenging problems of the future. Um, so he considered that um, bootstrap strategy as his greatest breakthrough of all. I mean, people say, oh, he did the mouse, he did the demo, he did all that kind of stuff, but it was that bootstrapping, because that's the thing that he embedded into the lab and sort of propelled all the work. They had a litmus test for the, for the prototype that they were developing. The litmus test was, is this making us more capable? Is this making us more effective? Is this making us more flat, fast and fluid and, and increasing our ability to do that coevolution? And if it didn't, then they tossed it. So having pretty printouts was not a priority for that. It was like, can we, how do we leverage the collective IQ of this group? Um, so uh, he pinned his hopes on that whole thing. And, and so when people <clears throat> uh, often uh, recognize that he had a lot of frustration about people not really hearing the whole picture, and they would focus on the mouse, or they would focus on the demo, or they would say, oh, well, it was about augmenting collective IQ, um, but it's this whole thing, and how are we gonna get society moving in this direction fast enough? Um, so we haven't scratched the surface and, uh, of the potential that he envisioned, and that was a frustration for him. But it was, he also chalked it up to, um, it's really coming from the paradigm, it's coming from what, how people think of the world and how we are in the world. It didn't seem like anything that was worth going after, or why would you do that? Why would you bother? Why are you talking about all this stuff? Because we can do hypertext this way, and why don't you just listen to us? So these were great frustrations for him, but he persevered, and he realized that it's people's paradigms, people's paradigms being the greatest limiting factor for um, the evolution of society, and so how do you change the paradigm? So he, so again, thought through all of these things. Um, so why the scale and urgency, let's um, call this Engelbart's law. Before there was Moore's law, he worked out the math of, um, of how technology would scale and then it would become more affordable and then it would be permeating every aspect of society and business and organizations and therefore, um, it's, it's therefore, it's going to cause actually a lot because it's going to get a life of its own, it's going to speed up, organizations can't evolve that quickly, and so pretty soon you get that imbalance that was talked about before, is that if, if one of them becomes more powerful, the social and the, and the technology, then the technology is driving the change. Organizations are, it's not in the service of organizations. Organizations are, are, are trying to adapt to the technology that wasn't adapted to them and what their needs are for the future. So that imbalance is created. Um, we all know about accelerating change. We're in a time of, of massive accelerating change. Uh, we're trying to, at unprecedented rate and scale, if you take all the changes of technology in the past that were major, like tools, language, writing, printing, all of that stuff, and compress it into a time frame, you're still not touching what we're experiencing today, and it's going to be accelerating even more. It's not just the acceleration, it's a magnitude issue. It's a magnitude of change, and part of it is because 
um, because of the disruption between the technology and the organization, the, without, the symbi without the symbiotic relationship, um, it all comes back around. So um, it's, you know, he anticipated that we would be experiencing disruption as never before in the compressed time frame. And you know, one example, climate change, is that technology you know, sort of unleashed all these things and we're doing all this, and all this sort of reckless, uh, senseless, uh, unmanaged, <laughs> and now here we are, and, and this was predicted, and, and we had a lot of data to show us and everything, but what's the inertia that prevented us from you know, that causes us to be in the situation that we are today. Um, climate change is not just a problem in itself, it's considered a threat multiplier. So that climate change, the way it interacts with all the other global issues and all the other, you know, dislocation of, of populations and um, warfare and all of that kind of stuff, all the things, the oceans and the, you know, can people live in Miami anymore and all this, this huge, all this stuff, um, threat multipliers, and it's a, also a threat multiplier to itself, which means as it progresses and so the ice caps are melting and then it, that makes the ice caps melt faster. So by not solving it, then it's getting worse. And so the whole effect is an exponential threat. And um, then if you factor in all of the other global issues that we face, and this is just sort of on the grand scale of things, the global issues, these are the toughest problems, it's the worst case scenarios, but um, the exponential risk because of the interaction of all of these, it's not like we have this global issue and this global issue and this, and if we could solve this and we could solve, but no, they're all interacting and they're all just this, so what they're creating, so the, it's an exponential risk. There's also a lot of opportunity in there for entrepreneurship and, and innovation and all that to solve these problems and to find new ways of doing these things, but there's also the risk, it's not the risk, the greatest risk is collapse. If you look at Jared Diamond, um, oh, my time's almost up. Jared Diamond uh, wrote a book on collapse, and you know what are the five factors that are involved? Most of those are collective intelligence. They are like you're not aware. You, the, the society hasn't been aware. The company just wasn't aware of this thing coming out of nowhere, or they were aware, but they didn't realize they really needed to do something, or they knew they needed to do something, but they didn't act quickly enough, or they didn't aim at the right level. They thought, oh, we'll just change this. But no, they should have changed like that. And so making these decisions. So now what we have is a situation where organizations are in a situation where they need to be changing faster than ever before. They're not equipped to be evolving that way. And with technology coming at them from all directions that weren't symbiotically developed with where they need to be next year and the year after and the year after, it's extremely expensive and puts a lot of pressure and stress on the organization itself. So how do we get those relationships together where the, um, where the end user organizations are pioneering the future of what kind of organization we want to become, and they become the, the customer of the future, which is to turn around and say, look, I'm your customer. Let's work together on what we really need. So it's those kinds of relationships that I think, besides the grand challenge level. Um, let me just flip. Um, yeah, so one big point about this is that with all this magnitude of stuff, what does that mean? So if there's a category one uh, hurricane coming or a category five, that makes a big difference. This last one down in the Carolinas, people were saying, oh, well, you know, I grew up with hurricanes, I don't need, oh, no. So they had to make public service, and this is not the hurricane you think of. You cannot survive this hurricane. So how do we put a number on what's going on in the world now that's causing all of this stuff or that what we're in the midst of that organizations are facing, managing in conditions of, of extreme uncertainty and risk? Um, how do you put a number on that? And how do you put a number on, okay, so we know what that is. This is we're talking category four. Well, what does that mean about my organization? Is, I mean, we keep improving, we keep improving how we do everything, but are you improving enough? And so I will tell you, my father would say, no. <laughs> so you're not aiming high enough and you're not aiming to go fast enough. And even if you did, even if you knew you needed to do that and you had all the resources in your organization to make that happen, how would you do that? Where would you start? So it's getting those kinds of expeditions going in the organization and networking those expeditions. So. Um, 
these slides are in here so you can come back to them. But I just wanted to make a point that uh, my father did all of this thinking after the technology phase. Um, he did management seminars. I pulled together all of that stuff off the Internet Archive and created the Engelbart Academy. So you can go and hear from him how he thought about all of this stuff. This is his message for the future, for the leaders of the future, what you need to be thinking about, how you need to change your paradigm. And this map here, these are all the paradigms that he saw need to shift in order for organizations to really be ready to get on the right course and go. So I um, have been working to distill all of that comprehensive knowledge into some actionable, um, sort of accelerators that any team or organization or initiative can start applying. And uh, a lot of it, I think, you know, people ask me sometimes, is, what, what would impress your dad the most about new trends? And I say, oh, well, I can tell you, <laughs> it's things like lean enterprise, design thinking, and all of that. It's in the organization side of it, because they're the ones who are looking at how do we need to change? Why do we need to change? And how are we going to do it? And they're getting, they're starting on that course. All the stuff my dad pioneered was, um, was stuff that can really add value to that because he was thinking in terms of not just how do we evolve, but how do we evolve and accelerate that? And how do we bootstrap that? And how do we get it at scale so that we can match the need? And I'm just going to, this really messed up. OK, so just a few things that we're doing at the Doug Engelbart Institute are opportunities. The 50th anniversary um, for us has been a springboard for looking at ways to coalesce different projects um, that can really start pursuing these kinds of things on a more concerted level. So the tool developers who are out here, and there's I think, you know, obviously a lot of stuff going on in the tool world, but the coalescing of this kind of thing is inspired by this kind of work. What are the kinds of tools and the thinking and the augmented knowledge and all of that? Fabulous. Expedition leaders, um, collaborative. We have three case studies from people who lead expeditions and um, organizations, and it can be very, um, very low tech, very um, low tech, but it's the organizational stuff and how do you, how do you launch an expedition and learn from it and really, you know, and, and have the biggest impact that you're looking for. So, um, that involves surfacing uh, research opportunities. It could be good to go after and get funding to do that kind of research, because a lot of it hasn't been done yet. Um, workshops, roundtables, and all that. Gardner's augmentation framework um, project that's starting up in, J in January. Um, We've been in some discussions with uh, the people in Japan who are putting on their um, version of this all over Japan. And I know some of you, Vint, and, and others are involved in that. But um, they're asking us to have some discussion about their starting this day as being Japan IT Day as an annual thing. So this is their first annual. And they've asked us to, um, to think about how about having a US IT Day every year and come back and think about these, these kinds of issues and then you know, having a World IT Day. Um, there's conferences coming up that are related to this. And so we're just making an opportunity for everybody who wants to stay engaged and connected and learning more and connecting with each other. Um, we just have a sign-up form, an old-fashioned sign-up form outside. And we'll be also putting one on the, on the um, website so people can sign up to stay engaged. OK, so I'm going to call. I'm going to stay off stage. Why don't you introduce your panel? OK. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. So we have Stephanie Couch, who's the executive director of the Lemelson MIT program. And she'll be telling us. Um, about some initiatives that she's been working on that are just right along these lines. So we have Brant Cooper from, uh-oh, Lean. No, Moves the Needle. Sure. <laughs> and he's involved. He's a consultant in the Lean arena and um, has a lot of overlap with, with um, the kinds of things that we're doing. Gardner Campbell, who you met earlier, um, who is not only a scholar of Doug Engelbart's work, but also a practitioner of these ideas. And so we're going to hear from Gardner first, I think, then Stephanie, then Brandt. Okay.
Well, thank you. The question of education has come up already today, and I am, uh, as I've said, an English professor. I've devoted my life to corrupting young minds one at a time, um, and at scale. Uh, that's the long time <laughs> part. Um, I had this idea that perhaps a 200-level general education course in how to write a college research paper might be augmented by employing the bootstrapping techniques of Doug Engelbart and the Augmentation Research Center. And this turned into what uh, we ended up calling thought vectors in concept space. This was, as I say, a bog standard, much dreaded and highly avoided course at Virginia Commonwealth University, not because the faculty weren't good, they were great, but because students had a very narrow idea of the desirability, uh, much less their own participation, in genuine research. They thought they knew what a term paper was, and generally speaking, it had to do with regurgitation and book reports. So we tried to do it differently. And we tried very deliberately and intentionally to do it by using the principles uh, that Christine has described as bootstrapping brilliance. The way this worked was eventually a website which was trailing edge technology, as John Udell puts it, RSS syndication, WordPress, and a number of feeds coming in and being orchestrated through some great design work by Alan Levine and Tom Woodward. And as we did this, we drew students' attention to the collective IQ in the course by having each student run essentially a research journal and reflection platform on their own blog site. A blog site on a WordPress multi-press, uh, WordPress uh, multi-site installation, which then would get syndicated into the main site. Rather than blogging to a main site, they blogged in their own spaces with their own thought vectors. And the concept space then became this place where we assembled what they were doing in their individual research sites into a collective site. We had a syllabus. It wasn't a completely insane course. We actually had things we did together uh, as per a certain schedule. But it was completely online. And what we called the product they would do was an inquiry project, not a term paper. We wanted them to employ multiple modalities from the very beginning. We worked very hard to give them as many opportunities as possible to exercise as many modalities as possible. Video, audio, still images, hyperlinks galore. And we engineered the entire environment thinking of what Alan Kay has said, which is that every user interface should also be a learning environment. So we had little leaderboards. We had little tallies. We had ways of putting the display of tags up on the site. We had little Easter eggs that uh, students would find and say, I hadn't seen that little thing that said, you augment me. And we said, yes, it was just there waiting for you, intrepid researcher, to see what nutty things we had put in this environment. One of the ways we got students to sign up for the syndication engine was to put them through a choose your own adventure environment designed by Tom Woodward. And you can see that we were always also thinking about arousing a certain sense of excitement and wonder as they were in this environment. So that's an animated GIF on the actual page. And if they already had a blog, we would, of course, say, wonderful, we share your excitement. It was a, an absolutely spectacular environment for us to talk about. We constantly were in a recursive frame of mind in which whatever was in the environment that brought all of our thought vectors together became itself a topic for conversation and discovery. We did this with one, two, three, four, five, six different sections. Each section was only 20 students, because you can't really scale up a writing class, in my view. But you can network the individual nodes on the network. Each of the faculty members had their own miniature aggregation pages, which they would decorate and they would design in their own way. All of those would then feed into the main class site. We had Team Zoetrope. We had Team Curiousness. We had Team 007, all about fighting secret agency. This was one fellow's complete bond thing he just decided to do to theme the research course that way. It's pretty clever stuff. Students would start to say, all these classes look different. Yes. All these classes are coming into the same concept space. Yes. 
Oh, e pluribus unum, yes. And they would begin to understand the work they did as individual learners in terms of a much larger collective action that actually added up to something. At least that was the idea. We had uh, team eight, which was team innovate. And you can see part of our strategy was to involve the design team, the faculty, Christina's input, the web designers, and we narrated our own building and design throughout the process. We put all of our big design meetings up online and began to have people interact with us from the open web, which was great. This was uh, my section, Team Revolution, because it was section nine, section nine, section, and this was section 10. Uh, and you will see here the title of the class, Living the Dreams, Digital Investigations, and Unfettered Minds. The inquiry projects ranged from this one having to do with virtual reality to things having to do with helium shortages. It was not only about cyberspace. And one of the things we did was also fold Twitter into the ecosystem. And as we put our design conversations up on the web, people started hooking into them and started finding us. Martin Hawksey, who was a researcher and developer at the Open University uh, in the UK, essentially said, look, I've got a thing that will visualize uh, Twitter tag interactions. Would you be interested? We said, would we be interested? This actually will play back as if in a movie the way each learner's network on Twitter begins to broaden and deepen over time. So students can begin to see the traces of their own engagement. Eventually, it looks like the Death Star. I think that's an 80-20 thing. I'm not really sure. But uh, that, too, became a topic for some conversation. All of our teachers' meetings were live streamed hangouts online. As uh, in this one, you can see with what we had uh, were embedded librarians who would interact with the students online and would also blog. And we eventually had a moment in which two students of conspicuous achievement were honored as Engelbart scholars. And what they were able to do then was during spring break, a great, satis a great uh, sacrifice for undergraduates, um, they were able to come out to here. They got to tour the Computer History Museum, the Engelbart Institute. They got to uh, look around SRI. They got to get a feel for this beautiful dream that maybe the world could be better and started to see how their own efforts might be able to plug into that. That was thought vectors in concept space. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie Couch, the executive director of the Lummelson MIT program. Um, one of the things, well, our mission is to inspire young people to pursue creative and inventive lives. And one of the ways that we do that is we give a $500,000 prize each year uh, for the last um, 24 years, next year will be 25, uh, to an inventor um, who we think is capable of inspiring young people. And I'm, I'm proud to say that Doug Engelbart was uh, the winner of our prize 21 years ago. He was our third prize winner. So I didn't get to meet him personally, but um, fortunately I got to meet Christina. So as I have read up uh, about his work, I see that an A-level activity in my world is our effort to educate young people. And his B-level activity he talks about when he, when he writes about organizational activity is really, from my perspective, our efforts to bring technology into the classroom. It is to improve learning, but it's not particularly transformational to the organization itself. I didn't start out uh, with a technology background. Uh, I started out in the world of education policy. Uh, but in 2000, got involved with the efforts to bring uh, a fiber-based network loop across California to connect all of high, higher education and then to build internet connectivity and high bandwidth out to our 6,000 schools in the state. And so when we first started in that effort in 2000, it was sort of like going from books to putting computers in the classrooms and streaming content 
and that was thought to be innovative. And I would say today we still talk about that as being innovative. We're going to launch a new online college in California, and we're going to get, get content streaming. Uh, but as I did that work, I started thinking about, well, how do we really leverage the bandwidth, and how do we really leverage all the emerging technologies to change our whole approach to teaching and learning? And this particular quote from Doug Engelbart really uh, um, resonates with me. Until we significantly stretch our perception of change opportunities in the human side of the equation, truly significant improvements in the organizational capability will be forestalled. And I, I think that still rings true today. I think there are a lot of opportunities for innovation in education that we have not yet reached. So, you know, that got me thinking about what the real killer app is when you have sufficient bandwidth. And to me, it's all the different types of technologies that allow for collaboration and allow for us to go beyond the walls of the classroom and the model of one teacher to 20 or 30 students. It's really when we can get kids engaging uh, with other people in lots of different environments in collaborative problem solving and active learning. And so um, fast forward to the work that I'm doing today. Uh, I had the privilege of joining this program two and a half years ago. And I, I wanted to go to MIT to learn about the program because for each year for the past 15 years, the, the staff in the program have taught 15 teams of high school kids and their teachers how to invent technological solutions to problems that the students find in their own local communities. And then the kids bring working prototypes to MIT. These are not the kids in advanced placement programs. These are kids in uh, low-income schools, uh, kids from underrepresented backgrounds, the girls that you typically would not find on, on uh, patents when they get a little bit older. They are inventing these technologies. And when I look at them, uh, what's really happening here is the program has designed uh, a model that builds on an ecosystem of support. The, the kids are working in their local communities to find the problem, design their solution, but it, the program structures that they have to go out and engage with members of the community. We also, at, at our staff's level, connect them with technology mentors who can help guide their uh, inquiry process and provide the right questions when they are stumped with where to go with the technology. This form of, of thinking about ecosystems then for learning, whether it's inventing or, or problem solving in general, then requires that the kids are learning in lots of different socio-cultural contexts. Their, their contexts include their school site and the teachers and the students at their school. It includes the people in the community, um, those who have a problem, for example, um, STEM experts, elected officials who are going to recognize their work. It involves other people in other communities at a distance. Those of us at the, and my staff at MIT, uh, the technical experts, uh, we have one in Woods Hole, for example, that, that collaborates online, and then other student teams themselves. So when we take up these new models of teaching and learning that really take advantage of the technologies, we no longer can assess learning with a standardized test that we can easily fit on a Scantron sheet. We have to think about a new approach where we can assess learning by observing what's happening in all those different contexts and what are the things in those discursive exchanges that are allowing our students, for example, to shift their thinking about themselves. What can we see in the shifts in the way they're thinking if we can't get inside their heads? we have to look at the discursive exchanges that they're having with other people so that we can see the routes and the routes that are taken to get to those new ideas and the shifts in their own identities of who they are and what they can be in this world. And for the program, we have to be able to look at what's happening when we have the conversations between the students and that expert in their community 
or when they're presenting at a mid-grant technical review to a room full of community members, what's happening to them? And how are they then going forward and taking that up and what they say and do next? So, you know, as a researcher in trying to understand this whole model and what's happening in an ecosystem for learning, uh, I started by being able to document what I can see from what my staff do in my own office. But now I need to be able to collect data and artifacts and video and the conversations that are happening out at the school sites and in students' local communities. And these 15 teams are distributed. I can't be there collecting this information. So how do we do that? Um, We've given a couple of teams this year these orange backpacks you see in the picture, and we've armed this, them with a variety of technologies so they can help us collect the information that we need to bring in. Now, this whole process that I'm talking about is exactly what people are calling for in some of the publications that are coming out, like this new uh, version two of how people learn from the National Academy of Science and Engineering and Medicine. Uh, there's a new uh, STEM plan that just came out about a week ago from the federal level that talks about a new, new approach to STEM education. It talks about inventing, active learning, collaborative problem solving, and ecosystems. But when I, when I look at what we've collected to be able to help us assess and learn in this ecosystem model uh, through the lens of interactional ethnography, which is what I've been talking about, I, I get to some cluttered Dropbox that has a bunch of artifacts that then still have to go from video, I've got to convert them to text, I've got to create transcripts, and then only then can I start analyzing uh, to be able to understand what was happening on the ground. And the, the, I, there are various technologies that get used, a lot of pieces that get pulled in, tons of work is super labor intensive, and I think, why don't I have the right technologies to make this easier? Why is this so hard for me? And it's so labor intensive that it's not a scalable system. I can't, we can't change learning until we change this, because we need to be able to assess learning. Otherwise, we resort back to standardized tests. So anyway, I, I applaud all of you doing the technology work. In fact, there may be technologies that solve this problem. And because I don't come from the world of technology, I may just not know that it ex exists. But um, I think this is a good example when um, Doug talked about the need to evolve the human systems with the tool systems we in education are trying to evolve and get to new models of teaching learning that are more impactful, but we really need to be in partnership with all of you designing the tools so that we can get where we need to go. Great, thank you. So hello, I'm Brant Cooper. Uh, I wrote the book, uh, uh, The Lean Entrepreneur. Uh, my company moves the needle. Uh, I describe it, ignites an entre uh, entrepreneurial spirit inside of large enterprises. Uh, Christina reached out a couple of years ago because the techniques that, that we're using, um, leveraging uh, lean innovation, which we, is a combination of agile development methodologies with design thinking and some rapid experimentation from lean startup, and this is what we bring to the large enterprises, but they, they, uh, we, here in Silicon Valley, we always like to pretend that we invented everything, so we, we kind of invented lean innovation, and then we find out that, well, actually, people have been doing this and talking about this for, for decades. Um, but when I was diving into Engelbart's work, what struck me was not the invention, not the technology, but it really was that it always came back to people. And so uh, listening today, uh, people talking about the the turmoil in the world and the massive amount of volatility and uncertainty. I, I didn't know Doug, unfortunately, but I don't think he'd be surprised by it. And so I think that what 
what he's really talking about, this uh, collective intelligence, is really getting back to the human element of it, that we were not going to evolve our brains uh, to keep up with the evolving technology. And so that the digital transformation was actually going to cause uh, the turmoil that we're living through now. And, and so I think that, uh, so you know, the, the, time is, the time is now. It, it, I don't think it's that the revolution has stopped or I don't think it's that the glass isn't full enough. I think it's that we're just getting to the time now that we need to be pulling this collective intelligence together, and it's at a human element. It's not a technology problem. Uh, and so I, it really struck me that that was really what Doug was talking about with the, with the bootstrapping. So, so part of this lean innovation, I describe it using the three E's of lean innovation. So it's empathy, it's understanding customers deeply. It's not about asking them what they want and doing what they say. It's, we're responsible for the solutions and, and then leading them like, like Tim, Tim suggested. Uh, it's about experimentation, the second E. So it's what are our riskiest assumptions about the solutions that we come up with and how can we purposefully run experiments into uh, testing whether those uh, assumptions are valid or not. And then the third E is evidence. And so how do we use the insights that we glean and the data from our experiments in order to decide what to do next? And so the key part of this, the bootstrapping the organization, is applying this entrepreneurial spirit to the organization itself. It's an, it's a, so we've got the, the lean from the lean manufacturing world that's about continuous improvement. And, and Doug said specifically, continuous improvement's not enough. You actually have to go back and reinvent structures inside the organization. And again, it's a, it's a human reinvention. And we don't get to choose how we as individuals will evolve. And so the whole way that we do this uh, co-development, this is co-evolution with the technology transformation is by pooling people together. It's the combination of human beings with a diversity of background that allows us to come up with the solutions to some of the biggest problems in the world as well as the smaller problems. And so, I sort of also have the three E's of organizational transformation, and it's enablement or education, enablement, and empowerment. And we tend to start from the top and work down, but we actually have to start from the bottom and work up. We actually have to change the mindset of individuals, and that's the entrepreneurial spirit. We get individuals to work in a way that is understanding how to develop empathy and how to run experiments and how to make decisions based upon evidence. And people are working this way inside of organizations. This is design thinking, and it's people that are doing agile development methodologies. And uh, people inside of larger organizations often have startups on the side, and they're entrepreneurial by nature. And so we start there, and we build those systems up. And then we educate the leaders. And the leaders are the ones that put the systems and processes in place that enable the people to continue to work that way. And then the final step is the empowerment. And that is the changing the fundamental structure of our organizations. Culture comes out of structure. So if we have structures that are defined by silos, then what we're going to have are organizations that are not uh, in touch with their customers, because you have to have permission to do that. You're not going to be agile. You're not going to be able to take in new information and change your plans and you're gonna be slow. And so that's what we're faced today in almost all of our institutions. So we can purposefully change the, the culture uh, through this grassroots mindset change, but in order to make that sticky, in order for that to be permanent, we actually have to then change the structure and allow the structure to come out of this culture that we've created. And so I don't know that anybody has completely figured out how to scale that yet, so you're right where you, you, know, you should be. Yeah. Um, but I think that there's uh, a lot of interesting reading out there. I don't know if anybody's read uh, Team of Teams by General McChrystal, but it's not surprising in this world that it's actually the US military that sort of ran into the first time the, the change of the world and the fact that the way they structured the military did not work when they faced really like a terrorism cells that were like blockchain, right? 
<laughs> and, uh, and so they had to completely reinvent the way special forces worked in order to combat that. And so the book Team of Teams actually talks about the cross-functional nature um, and, and how the organization had to develop and then Team of Teams is how they, they scaled that. And so I guess what my, my point really is here is that we have to apply our entrepreneurial spirit as entrepreneurs here to the organization itself. We apply the empathy and the experiments and evidence on how we make the organizations change. And we apply this to large enterprises, to government institutions, to nonprofits, to education. And we have to be willing to make those big changes to the, to the very structure, the way we operate. And then that, I believe, optimistically, is what is going to create the, the ability to, to discover and create new value uh, out of all of those institutions that are going to be able to face down, face down the big problems. Mm -hmm. Inside the organizations that we work with, we run into major obstacles. I'm sure you can well imagine trying to get organizations to go and talk to customers and run experiments and do things differently is challenging. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of frustration. And what I tell people is we can't overcome obstacles until we run into them. And so I think that it's absolutely extraordinary to me that Doug was thinking about this stuff in the 50s and the 60s. And I think it, by the 90s, he was really frustrated that the changes weren't happening yet. And I, human, you know, our brains have evolved to eliminate the threats that are in front of us. That's what we do is we break down what is in front of us, the uncertainty in front of us, and we're going to assess whether this is going to affect our survivability. And even inside of those organizations, we're going to tackle the issues that we've, we're faced with today. And so it's very difficult for organizations to think three years down the road or five years down the road. You have to run into the obstacles in order to overcome them. And so that's actually where we are. And again, to me, that means the time is now. We're faced with these major obstacles. And so we have to apply this entrepreneurial spirit, not on the technology. We have to not go after the technical risk. We actually know how to solve the technical risk. You guys are geniuses in this room overcoming the technical risk. But so how do we use those same principles to actually do the organizational change that actually is going to prepare us to be able to overcome the, the large obstacles uh, that we face as a society? That's Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you. So, um, so one of the things to point out here, I'm going to make a few observations, and then I'll ask each of them to make some observations about what they've heard from the other. Um, so let's see. In terms of one thing to say, though, is that they each come from different backgrounds, obviously, but they're also very much facing a lot of the same questions, a lot of the same big questions, and also what are the big ideas for going after solving these, and how can they leverage that within their particular worlds? So one of the things that is that my father saw was very beneficial was when people are working in these different environments, well, you can, you can get with other faculty and you can get with other STEM people who are trying to solve a problem and you can get with other lean people. You're just gonna, it's, it's very ancestral because you're just gonna talk about the same things you always do. But when you get talking across each other, you're gonna talk about the things you have in common. And that is where the most powerful can happen. And, and what you can learn from each other. And so we're actually starting a informal collaborative to start doing that to see what comes of that and, and where we can take that. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out about Gardner's projects is that um, he mentioned the design team itself pulling together a collaborative of faculty to design this course and that they made all of that open and transparent and so all they had to do once they started the course was just invite the participants in and have them do the same thing that they were doing, set up a blog, get over the barrier of actually blogging into the, and all that kind of stuff. And so, so that is a very good example of bootstrapping. They were trying to develop capability that would make, um, you know, that would, that would add more um, to what they were all doing and then 
and then do it to themselves first so that they really get it and they iron it out and then bring the rest of the people on. And then you can scale from there because you know, he's done courses like this where other universities were invited to participate and they did parallel courses and they did, you know, a PhD, a PhD researcher came in and participated in this and, and did a whole thesis on how the students were learning from each other in this participatory environment. So, um, so it's very powerful, and that's sort of the bootstrapping. They were very attentive to co-evolving, and um, also thinking about the capability. They weren't talking about, here's a tool, and write a research paper, and make sure that you cite these references. They were saying, what is it we want them to, to really explore? The inquiry, that's the capability. And when you look at capability, you just can end up with a lot more of a powerful vision of what's possible then bootstrap the parts that you can do first and then build on results. So that was taking up a lot of time. Um, Stephanie, and one of the things in her um, research is that if you look at each of those schools where they have the invent teams, they're trying to network resources within the locality. So the, the faculty is trying to bring in the mentors from the community and parents' participation, and then there's how do they get a makerspace and all these things that they need to pull together. And, and now thinking in terms of a network of those networks so they can share across and learn from each other. And then that's very powerful and that's a level of bootstrapping and networked improvement. And then how do you get the tools in there that support that kind of exploration? So networks of networks and networks of networks of networks. So that's very powerful. And then Brandt has all this great insight and. Uh, into so many different organizations. And I think one of the things that uh, struck me is that in first coming up with Lean and getting to know you a little bit is that, you know, all the things that my dad talked about is very big, um, strategic. What Lean is doing and what moves the needle um, is that if you started with that, you're totally on the right track. Everything that they do is all what my dad would say, yep, yeah, that's exactly right. And then what he would do from his model is just add some value back into that. He never said, do mine instead of theirs. Find the best practices, find the best, of merge it together. There's design thinking and all that. And Brandt is a, is a great example of that. And then- So it reminds me of the, well, the, the, uh, the company that actually manufactured this coat, mm -hmm. uh, they, invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in digital fabrication equipment. So great technology, digital wow. cutters, digital sewers, wow. supposed to bring down the time to create new product samples from four months to four days. And they got no return on the investment. So to me, this is a great example of the technology versus the people thing. Right. And the reason was because the people inside and the processes were exactly the same as before they had the technology it was the same afterwards. Yeah. Right? So they didn't see any of the return. Mm -hmm. And applying those principles, those, those lean innovation principles, teaching them how to act like a startup, in two days, the design team acted like the startup, the manufacturing floor was the customer, and in two days, they completely reinvented how they worked together. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't get it down to four days right away, they got it down to a couple of weeks, but saved this huge government contract, and, and they got their return on investment of our, our little workshop. But the idea, these people worked 100 feet from each other. They went to the same pub after work, and they, they were friends. But it had never really occurred to anybody that you actually have to change the way you work. Right. And again, continuous improvement doesn't solve that. You actually have to go back, erase the, the chalkboard, start with the clean slate, and reinvent. And so it's this idea of reinventing, reinventing the, the infrastructure that, that brings us to, uh, to solving those problems. Yeah. That's fabulous. I guess I just want to build on that. Um, you know, there's um, lots of data out there about the, the kinds of divides we have in terms of um, patent holders and those who are uh, inventing and engaging in inventing activity, 90% uh, male, 10% female. And so one of the things we've been looking at is what happens to young women when they go through this alternate type of learning opportunity that I was describing earlier. And the young women tell us um, things like, you know, this is the first time I've ever had an adult conversation with an adult about something meaningful. Mm -hmm. 
And you can see when they're presenting their ideas for the invention to their community in what we call a mid-grant technical review, they're like, oh my god, I'm finally doing something people care about and find value in. And this is going to mean so much to my community. Mm -hmm. I have to learn what I need to learn yeah. to do this, because I can't fail all these people. <laughs> And so you see them go into low gear. Mm -hmm. And we had a group of, of young women as one example, uh, young Latinas from, from Southern California who had never done anything in the STEM area whatsoever. And they're learning how to code by watching videos on their phone. And they invented a uh, solar tent for homeless moms to charge the cell phones that the county gives them wow. to keep in touch with social services. We said, you know, what motivated you to pick this as your invention topic? And one of the young women said, well, you know, we're only one paycheck away from that. Mm. So at the end of this activity, looking at the, the young woman in the research study, even though no background, she went on to college to pursue a, a computer science degree, enrolled in introduction to computer science. She had wanted to be a journalist before that. Nothing wrong with being a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> but you see the transformative effects. So we have to reinvent a lot of things along with using the technologies and developing the new technologies mm -hmm. to enable us to bring about these changes. And um, it, 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 there's a lot to what your dad put in the bootstrapping paper that we, we still need to break down the silos and work more in interdisciplinary yeah. partnerships. That's really beautiful. And, and I would just say that I heard this pop up in an earlier session. What if people don't want this? Uh, <laughs> and over the years, my own work has gotten kind of pared down to help my students understand the possibility of intellectual augmentation, help my students understand the desirability of intellectual augmentation, and help them understand what kinds of networks they can begin to find on their own to do the kind of work we're describing. Unfortunately, there are a number of social and educational structures that either deliberately or unwittingly militate against a sense that intellectual augmentation is possible or desirable, or they'll simply say, Sure, what you're doing by perpetuating our structures now, we'll call that augmentation. <laughs> and it cuts off any possibility of the grandest thing we have as human beings, mm -hmm. which is the ability to reinvent. Uh, and without that, we got nothing. Great. Well, we'll leave it with that then. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we wanted to take this opportunity to uh, make a special recognition for two of the men who were most instrumental in putting on the demo. So here we are 50 years after the demo. It's almost actually at the exact time when they started the demo. I think it was 3.45 in the afternoon. <laughs> Bill English and Jeff Rolofson. So we haven't seen Bill English. He's not here today. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it. But Mark, Mark but will accept it in his stead. Mark Weber? Mark Weber. Oh, OK. Yes. So Mark Weber will accept in his stead an award. So what we have is after the demo, the conference where the demo was given and all that amazing response, thank you, the organizers of the conference had an award made to present to my father in recognition for a quite unique presentation and their deep appreciation for what that was. So my sister-in-law made two replicas so that we could have one for Bill and one for Jeff. So we'd like to ask Jeff to come up, please. And Mark Weber. And Mark. Martin or Mark? <laughs> and they should be, oh, there it is, okay. <laughs> Sorry, got my Watch you make remarks from the podium after you receive it. Okay. So this is really from my dad in heartfelt recognition for all of your amazing work. And I mean, he, he knows he couldn't have done it without you. And there it is. So. Oh. <laughs> I'm getting emotional. I have a panel yet this afternoon. Um, okay. um, well, so thank you very much. It's just, it's just 
I'm just all thanks. Um, and keeping in the spirit of things, thanking Janet too. Um, I wanted to somehow weave this in. That when I when we get to our panel, we're gonna dive a little deeper into, into some of Doug's thinking. And uh, not only did she put up with a lot of <clears throat> 24 hour days working at SRI, but we lived in student housing at Stanford. And uh, she uh, put up with, uh, with Doug coming to our apartment in student housing <laughs> and talking about A, B, and C behavior and <clears throat> improvement, networked improvement communities and all of this and trying to work them out. So thanks to Janet and thank you guys. Thank you, Jeff.